Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Better Together webinar series. This is uh, great to have everyone here today, and we're so excited to have John Martin, a good friend of, of mine and, and Plan RVAs, to talk today about uh, the future of regions and then the context of RVA 757 Connects and what might be happening in the future with the I-64 Innovation Corridor. John, we're so glad to have you here. And as you know, this series was kicked off just earlier in 2020 and is really an opportunity to highlight the exciting things that are happening in the Richmond region around collaboration. Couldn't think of a better example of what, what the potential for collaboration is between our region and the Hampton Roads region. Um, I'm seeing that a number of attendees are signing on right now. So I'm gonna kick it over to you and uh, let you take the show just for everyone that's listening to know we have a presentation from John Martin. Um, President and CEO of SIR, Center for the Future. And he will be talking about uh, lots of different things today. So hopefully it'll be educational. And for those of you that are attendees on the Zoom webinar, you'll have a chance to ask John questions or maybe even enter into a little bit of a dialogue at the end of the presentation. So John, take it Great. away. Thank you so much, Martha. It's always a pleasure to work with you and plan RBA. And today to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is uh, emerging mega region that we're creating. So I wanna make sure and get some confirmation that, um, that you guys can see my slides. Everybody can see this title slide okay? Yes, you, you, you've got it, yes. Great, okay. Well, I'm gonna share with you a story about RVA 757 Connects. Uh, two Regions Unlimited Possibilities. And this is the name of the organization that has finally uh, reached a point where we're now official, we're a 501c3, and we are advancing Hampton Roads in the Richmond regions as a mega region. And I wanna explain to you the, the everything behind that, what we're all about, some recent news, uh, where we're headed, uh, and really leave with uh, an important message why this is important. Uh, and invite everybody to help us uh, move our two regions forward. So what we're all about. Well, for those of you that have been in the mega region uh, books and articles and publications over the last really 50 years, you realize this is an old concept. It got started uh, really just to the south of us with North Carolina's research triangle. And it's a way that three cities started working together uh, really around the universities in, in central North Carolina. And, really becoming a uh, technology think tank 50 years ago. And the same with California, Silicon Valley. Uh, it's more than one jurisdiction, it's many jurisdictions. And they all started working together and working on, well, computers, silicon chips. In Boston, uh, outside of the city, there's Route 128. It's a corridor with a lot of uh, technology firms and that's been around for decades. So these are the, these are the three sort of granddaddies of mega region mega regions. And, and since they got started, we're starting to see the formation of other mega regions across the country. There are 11 now. And uh, you can see from this diagram of the US uh, where they're located, you know, some have some intentionality behind them in organizations and others are just sort of like the Texas Triangle, they're just happening. Uh, but, but what is happening, the real story is inside of these mega regions, what is happening that they represent 70% of the US population and a huge part of the jobs and economic GDP, the economic gross domestic product of the US. It's coming out of these 11 mega regions. And so when we look at a map like this, all of us from Virginia are saying, well, where are we? Where is Richmond and where's Hampton Roads? Are we part of the sort of that Piedmont mega region? Are we part of the Northeast one? Or, or dare to dream, could we create one ourselves? Well, now this concept of mega regions is really getting traction and people are writing about it. And one of the authors that uh, is sort of sourced the most is Jonathan Barnett. He wrote a book called Designing the Mega Region, which was all about intentionality that don't just let it happen. Don't let two cities sort of grow together, but actually be intentional and get the best out of what each jurisdiction can offer. And so Jonathan's point is that this is the new competitive unit and really being intentional about the evolution of it and shaping it uh, will put you in the best spot. And that's really the conceit behind what is happening out in Cascadia. They're a mega region out in the Northwest and you have three cities now working together, Portland, Seattle, and Vancouver, all on a high-speed rail line that's gonna connect them. 
this is this is their dream. And I tell you, it, it's not going to happen if they don't plan it and start working towards it. And that's what they're doing. They're being intentional about this one dimension. And what we see often is the co the cooperation inside a mega region usually is singularly focused either on workforce or on transportation connections. What we're about in our fledgling uh, intentionality is the economic success and quality of life of both RBA and the 757 regions. So we're taking a very broad perspective and I'll share with you in a few minutes the kind of things that we're working on and you'll see it really crosses the gamut. Our performance measures are really the measures that we have for the performance of each region. It's you know, are we seeing increases in the gross domestic product? Are we seeing per capita income grow, private and government investment, job growth, or talent pool uh, growth and, and qualified talent? And then ultimately the quality of life and well being that we're enjoying. And so the key here is in both markets. And what we like to think about is that, yes, in some cases we do compete against Hampton Roads being from the Richmond region. But in other cases, we do better if we cooperate. So the way we're thinking about this is, that where there's not scale, then we should be working together. And when one of us has scale, well then let's just be friendly competitors. So what's the strength of our mega region organization, RBA 757 Connects? Well, in a word, it's the network. We're an inclusive, mutually supportive network of leaders representing community, business, and higher education. And our organizational structure is twofold. We have a board of directors, the trustees, and I'll share a list in just a minute, but, but this is the group that, that makes the decisions and that votes on policy and that decides priorities. But we also have a sister component, which is the Mega Region Institutional Council. And we're calling this group the MIC for short. And this is because this is the group that really has the microphone for us. This is the group that really has some experience in the markets and knowing what it takes to do improvements or or what priorities uh, make sense or not. So this is sort of the advisory board without voting authority for RVA 757 Connects. So here's their board of directors um, list. And I wanted to start with the EC members because you might recognize some names here from the Richmond community. Certainly everybody knows Bob Holsworth uh, and Peggy Lane and Ted Chandler. And Cliff Fleet, we have to still hold on to him. He ran Philip Morris for a number of years and now he's the head of Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. But you see also we're, we're represented equally from the 757. This is a little bit of an eye chart, but if you scan it, you might recognize some names. This is our board of directors and we're about halfway to our 75 seats. Uh, and you'll notice these really are the CEOs and, and uh, thought leaders from both regions. This is an important group because this is the group that we're gonna call into action when we really want a priority to be everybody's priority. And I'll share those in just a minute. Um, when I say we're halfway there, we really wanna finish out our board with uh, a much greater feeling of diversity and also youth. And so we're in the process of, of recruiting our final uh, list of board members for both RVA and 757 uh, from both markets. And we really would like to, make this board an example of the way boards should look uh, today and in the future, that it should have uh, current leaders, but also up and coming leaders. And it should represent a great amount of diversity of thought and, and diversity of experiences uh, and, and just about every form of diversity that we can think of, because that's really the power, I think, of organizations. So I mentioned the Mega Region Institutional Council, and, and we have fun while we're calling this the mic, it really is this acronym, Mega Region Institutional Council or MIC. It, it's, it's the group that, that holds the microphone and says, hey guys, y'all really should be thinking about this. Or, you know, if you really want to put a priority together and, and like get more passenger rail started or uh, increase, this is uh, the process that you have to go through. So the, the MIC has some, you know, institutional cover in terms of they don't vote. Um, um, they don't get involved in the nitty gritty, but they are very informed people that we can turn to. And I'm pleased to say that Martha uh, ably represents Plan RBA on the mic. Uh, and what is so neat, the way we built this is the, the mic members, we have a parallel structure. So just as Martha and Plan RBA are on the mic, so too is Bob Crum and the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission. And the two community foundations, one from Richmond, one from Hampton Roads. The chamber from Richmond, 
And the Hampton Roads is spread out a little bit more than Richmond. They have three different chambers, but all three are represented. Um, the Economic Development Partnership in Richmond, and then the Hampton Roads Alliance and Hampton Roads. Go Virginia, Region 4 and Region 5. The, the Workforce Councils in both markets. Um, Civic Leadership Institute is uh, sort of like Leadership Metro Richmond. And then our uh, workforce boards, the Grow Capital Jobs Foundation and reInvent Hampton Roads. Um, and Management Roundtable too here in Richmond and then in Hampton Roads Business Roundtable. So the, the power of this is this parallel structure because um, most of the people know one another in these organizations across the market lines uh, and can really lean into uh, advice uh, and, uh, and uh, also keep us away from landmines. So we're really pleased the way this structure has worked out um, and it's really guiding us well. So our pathway is to identify and support major opportunities and initiatives that are gonna benefit this mega region for generations to come. So we think big and we're working on big projects. Um, our collaboration really enables us to sort of leverage uh, our strength to strength. And if you think about the assets that Hampton Roads has uh, and the assets that Richmond has, they're very complementary, uh, not necessarily redundant. And so that's what we're trying to figure out uh, and work on. How do we leverage one another's strengths where one plus one equals three? So recent news. Well, we've been at this for a number of years. In fact, in 2014, um, a group of executives from both markets got together and started talking uh, in, in, in working on this idea of how could we help each other and the port came up. And in fact, one of the first byproducts of our conversation was introducing the Virginia Port Authority to the Richmond Marine Terminal and in helping to uh, facilitate actually a 50 year lease that is now signed where the city of Richmond owns the Richmond Marine Terminal, but the Virginia Port Authority actually runs it and will for years to come. Uh, and what has happened since that relationship is that uh, traffic has continued and now there's a regular barge service uh, on the James River. Uh, and if you spend any time near the Richmond Marine Terminal, you'll just see what a logistics center it's turned into right outside of its gates on 95. So this was um, really wind in our sails when this happened and when we saw the result and the benefit to not only the Hampton Roads uh, port, but the Richmond port, the Marine Terminal. And we said, gosh, we got to do more of this. So we started meeting often in Williamsburg, but as an informal group of CEOs and in members of that mic, uh, and eventually got to a saying we got to get more formal here. So the two chambers actually put on a bus trip with the CEOs in both markets. And we spent overnight in uh, Williamsburg and, and talked more and more about what should we be focused on? How should we start to collaborate? Uh, we went and got hype three. And, um, and the, the people that are involved in this said, you know, we really need a CEO. And so they, um, they pointed to me and said, would you be our first CEO to help get this going? And so I'm committed to this for the uh, you know, foreseeable future to really get some energy here and, and stand this up. Uh, we've been really blessed with, with funding uh, people, uh, and I'll go through a list in just a minute, but people have given us uh, funding to support our 501c3 so we could work on initiatives. And so where, where are we headed? Well, we just had a board meeting in January uh, and followed up with a survey of all members and made sure that we had um, support on the priorities for RVA 757 Connects. And these are the nine. And I'm gonna take you through each one of these. You don't have to memorize this list, but um, it starts with running the 501c3. Cause now that we're official, we have to file things like uh, documents with the federal government and, and, uh, and, and to make sure that uh, when we hire people and we do everything in a blue perfect way. And so number one goal is to, to run this uh, little small company or nonprofit in a way that, that doesn't get in trouble. But, um, but really the power, as I've shared, is that network, the board and the, and the mic relations. So making sure everybody is on board and understands and that we communicate well with all the people that are putting in their volunteer time to this is critically important. And then communicating what we're doing. And uh, so that's marketing communications. And we're really fortunate to have uh, Moses Foster in the West Cary Group. Moses is on um, 
the executive committee of RVA 757 Connects and his firm is doing a, uh, a lot of the marketing effort behind uh, RVA 757 Connects. And then we have a number of grants and we have to provide that grant support. And then we have to continue our fundraising. And these are the groups that have supported us to date, the two community foundations, one in Hampton Roads and the one in Richmond. And then Dominion Energy has been very generous with the three-year gift, um, Virginia Natural Gas, Bank America, uh, one of the founding fathers, I think, of, of modern day Richmond, Jim Ucrop has been very supportive personally. Uh, and then LifeNet, which is a, a company sort of like Unos that we know here in Richmond, but in Hampton Roads. Uh, so this list, the next time I, I share information with you, I'm sure is gonna be three times as long now that we are really organized and we're focused on our priorities. Um, I'm, I fully expect all of our members will contribute at some level. Uh, we're not looking for the mic to, to contribute. We're really looking at the mic as advisors. So the second priority is to advance our mega regions brand. And, and in terms of branding, there are three components that we have thought about. One, we really make sure people understand where we are. So a, a place name or an icon, uh, but also you think about Silicon Valley and Silicon talks about chips and you talk about Research Triangle and that talks about a lot of the university work that's going on. Um, and th thirdly is it's gotta be relevant to the future. And so these are the three things that, that we thought about. We tried to come up with what should we call our mega region? So what do people outside of our mega region think about when they hear about us? We don't want them to think about just the name of our organization, RVA 757 Connects. That's a, that's a fun name. Uh, it's got some energy to it, but that doesn't really define our region. So I want you to think back these three original mega regions and the way they're sort of branded. And sometimes branding's not intentional. It just sort of uh, develops over time. We wanna be a little more intentional. Um, and one of the things my firm, uh, when I'm not running RVA 757 Connects, I, I have a marketing research company in town called SIR. And, and, and we do a lot of future studies and look at data and trends. And one of the things that we know with certainty because of demography, we're gonna go back to a time when unemployment's gonna be 3.5% and we're gonna be screaming for talent. And uh, you just look at it, we're getting older as a population and that working age population isn't growing as fast as the total US population. So um, we, we feel like talent is gonna be really important in the future. Another thing that's gonna be important is technology. This is Moore's law that um, is, is a great way to understand the pace of technology. This is how many transistors can fit on an integrated uh, circuit chips. And what we have found since the advent of computers and the understanding of how to make computers work with these little silicon chips, every 18 months, the computing power doubles. The number of transistors that can fit on an integrated circuit chip is just doubles. Every 18 months, it's linear. But now it's reached a point where it's really outpacing even that. And so we'll reach a point where quantum computing is possible. Uh, and, and eventually we'll reach something that, that I hear about a lot in conferences that I go to, future conferences, uh, technological singularity, where computers are connecting to each other and, and helping each other, basically. It's, it's uh, like an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie on steroids. Um, so what this really means though, is that everybody, every company, every household is really powered by technology. And so even a, a, a small piece of delivery service is really gonna be dependent on technology in terms of when that next piece is coming out of the oven and, and where that driver is, all the way up to the most sophisticated companies um, around, technology is gonna rule in, in innovation. And so when we look to the North and to the South of us, right now we said, wow, innovation is starting to be the hot word is like, how do you in this world where technology is more than, 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 than doubling every 18 months, you know, once a year, what, what is it gonna take to remain competitive? And how are we gonna attract the kind of workers that really uh, are part of the innovation equation? Well, to the north of us, there's a mega region that is getting some traction now. It's the Greater Washington Partnership. It's from Baltimore to Washington, and they include Richmond in there, but, um, the, the, the majority of the focus is on that Baltimore-Washington corridor, uh, and they are quickly becoming an innovation corridor. Um, if you look to the south of us, we know the Research Triangle 
is certainly a home of innovation and technology. Well, they are officially, and they've published this plan in April, they're officially gonna move, the research triangle is gonna move to the east and west and they really wanna turn it into an innovation corridor uh, in the center of North Carolina and, and potentially maybe reach Charlotte, which is a technology juggernaut in the uh, FinTech world. So when we think about the future and we think about this innovation to the north and south, um, we also wanna think about what is the kind of workforce that we're gonna need in the future. And what we're seeing with COVID that is that there's actually a silver lining. Uh, it's an opportunity for both RBA and 757 regions to leverage something that we have really over everybody. And that's our remarkable quality of life. Uh, before COVID, we were seeing trends of workers fleeing big cities for smaller ones and taking their jobs with them. Because remember, we had that unemployment rate that was just like historic low, 3.5%. And so when someone in New York said to their boss, hey, I just want to go back to RVA and work there. I'll find another job. The bosses would say, no, you, you're still going to work for us. Uh, so that started happening. But then when COVID hit, wow, did it, did it really push that trend that people leaving the largest uh, metropolises and, and heading to places where, well, where people are spread out and where the quality of life is great. And so we've been watching this closely. We, we predicted this right well, a year ago in March and started writing about it. Uh, and now we're seeing studies come out and show that net change in migration, the larger areas, the larger cities uh, are the ones that actually are in red and they're losing population. And the ones in green are the smaller places that are gaining in population. And if you look at Richmond and Hampton Roads and parts of Hampton Roads, uh, we're in the green. So that's great. In fact, we're starting to see articles come out um, on where tech workers are moving. And this is one that literally mentioned Richmond as one of those destinations. I don't follow Google or Amazon, but they did. they're now going to have policies in place where new workers are never expected to come into the office. I'm not saying that's where we're going to all end up. I certainly want to see my workforce again. I'm going to see my workforce again. Uh, I think that we're not going to go back to everybody working five days a week in the office. I think that um, in some cases it might be four or three or some sort of flex time, but I think um, we're just going to see something different. Uh, after COVID than we saw before, but but we're going to see this trend. In fact, we were we were sharing before COVID hit that our workforce was going to reach this flexible distributed nature by 2030, that half of the workforce would be there. Um, and now what we're seeing, and other studies are, are uh, reinforcing this, by 2025, we're going to reach that 50%. And again, I'm not saying 50% are going to be teleworking 100% of the time but I'm saying that 50% are gonna have this built-in flexibility. And some people are gonna be able to say, well, look, I'll, I'll work for you in Washington, but I'm gonna live in Richmond, or I'll work for you uh, somewhere else, but you, you, you're only gonna get me there two days a month or something. So it's gonna be interesting to watch, uh, but I think this really creates for us this opportunity to start to define ourselves as the I-64 innovation corridor. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I'm just over 60, and I remember when uh, we were competing against Charlotte for Piedmont Airlines, and we didn't win. And that that really put some wind in Charlotte sail. They were about the same size city as we are or were back at the, that time. And then uh, along came the banking mergers, and um, our rules didn't didn't facilitate the bank staying here. And North Carolina's uh, rules did, so we lost their banks and. Uh, and then you can throw in the NASCAR Hall of Fame. I'm not sure I'm gonna to cry too much over that, but, but it was not fun losing that. Um, so this is an area where I think the next battle is gonna take place and, and we're not gonna lose this one. So we have a ton to talk about in terms of innovation and from a technology story, RBA and 757. But what we're thinking about is innovation with a twist that it's more than technology you know, this is uh, our positioning statement on that, what is driving our marketing materials. You know, we're this 800 square mile area that, that runs from Richmond to Hampton Roads and Interstate 64 is the major connector. Uh, but what it's connecting is really a model of sustainability and resiliency, uh, not just the tech sector, but every sector. And, and it's been this way for 400 years. I mean, 
right now we're hyper connecting and collaborating and sharing and, and, and we're doing it in so many different ways. Um, business opportunities, scientific breakthroughs, world-class health and well care, military advancements, artistic endeavors, uh, and even equitable social and economic opportunities. And, and, the, and the twist is that this is all happening right here where there's an exceptional, remarkable quality of life, a place where you can live, work, learn, and play that, that is really second to none. Um, and I, I just, I feel this in my bones. I travel across America speaking and I just love coming home and uh, realize uh, how fortunate we are to all call this place home. So I don't expect you to see this, but we'll get these slides out after this. But this is looking at how we have innovated in workforce and, and in entrepreneurial endeavors and logistics. We've become a logistics center here in Richmond and certainly Hampton Roads is with the port, but even education innovation and government innovation, nonprofit innovation, uh, mobility, food security, and what's happened during COVID and how we've come to that call in health and well care innovation during a big event we had in Williamsburg this uh, past October we had Howard Kern the CEO of Centera and Michael Rao president of VCU and VCU Health on the podium talking about their collaboration they own a health insurance company together but but all the ways that they're working to end or to to take an edge off health disparities in, in very much looking at this whole area in, in partnership. So, so positioning the I-64 Innovation Corridor and bringing that to life is our second, second task. The third is to implement a Go Virginia talent study. Uh, and this is on uh, our talent pipeline. And we've put together an all-star cast. This, uh, I hope you recognize some of these names. Uh, we have a national resource in, in Chris Chimera and. Uh, I hope many of you know Bob Holsworth and Decide Smart and um, Jennifer Wakefield, who now runs the Greater Richmond Partnership, and he's and Brian Davis, our Workforce Council. And so this is this is a group of RVA and 757 uh, Brainiac. So I should have mentioned Renee uh, Holtum at the Federal Reserve. She's terrific. And so we're meeting every two weeks and uh, with this Go Virginia grant, and we're studying. What does the workforce look like today? And wh where are our strengths and where are our gaps um, it, when we take a broad mega region perspective? And so we're profiling the mega region's talent pool. And that's gonna be our first report uh, and understanding where does our talent come from and where does it go? Because some people do leave our markets. Um, and what are the current gaps between where the jobs are and, and, uh, and what we're not filling enough with our pipeline? Uh, and really point to areas where we can have some immediate impact. You know, we really are, when you think about this together, we're, we're 1.5 million workers, which is huge. And so sometimes it, it makes sense to combine our numbers, other times it doesn't. But in this case, we wanna combine it and see where our strengths are and where our weaknesses are. And then we also wanna look at the future, which is our second report. What are the big trends that are happening? Um, and what are the impacts of those trends? And, you know, thinking about tech talent and adjacent tech talent, uh, as I mentioned with Moore's Law, I mean, everything is going to be fueled by innovation and technology. So are, are we, how many people are we educating in those areas and where do they go and how do we keep more and how do we upskill people uh, to get ready for the jobs of the future and the coming automation? And with all of this, uh, in addition to the two reports, we're gonna identify a pathway for us in, in some big ideas on, on where we can go in terms of talent because we know that's gonna be a defining term uh, you know, well into the future for our mega region. I'll give you an example of the promise here. The Greater, Rich, the Greater Washington Partnership uh, about a year ago did a very similar project, a very similar study. Um, and, and what they found that they had a real shortage of tech talent and adjacent tech talent. And looking forward uh, at their, their Moore's Law chart, they said, oh my gosh, we are going to be in a deficit that we've got to become much more of a tech center. So they created the Capital CoLab uh, out of their study, their very similar study to, to what we're doing. And this CoLab is an action-oriented partnership of employers and academic institutions that are focused on the talent needed for today and tomorrow, and particularly the tech talent. So they want to be the most diverse digital tech workforce in the country. And so their mission is to to build an ecosystem and partner with employers and educators to make this happen. Uh, and they've got some quantitative goals set up, some, some pretty bold goals to have 45 students and adult learners 
uh, engaged in digital tech pathways. They want to make sure that they uh, engage people in underrepresented populations, and and they're just on this. What is so interesting is they got three products already created. Um, one is the K through 12 Pathways Initiative, tying into the school system, and then a Capital CoLab Digital Tech Credentialing, and our own VCU is providing those uh, credentialing badges, and then an upskilling program for existing workforce. So in a short order, they put this together. So I'm really excited to see where we go from our Go Virginia grant. The folks at Go Virginia are expecting us to, to, to uh, learn something through the first two studies and then to come back to them with uh, maybe not exactly this idea, but something that can really make sure that we're intentionally leaning into our success with talent in the future. Um, and the employees in Washington market, Baltimore market have gotten excited and, and uh, are all in on what the Washington Baltimore partnerships doing. So I think our employee base will be the same uh, once we get to that point. Number four, showcase and support our members initiatives. So we've got some some folks that really believe in us and that are on our board and that come to the meetings and, and help point to priorities. And uh, some of them like Dominion Energy are invo involved in something really important in terms of the future. And in this case, it's offshore wind. Uh, so Dominion Energy is the first, uh, first energy company to actually put wind turbines on federal land, federal sea in this case, um, and, and right now, the, a couple of these are going up and they plan to get close to 200 of these off the shore of Virginia, uh, about 29 miles out, 30 miles out. Uh, but there's going to be a whole farm producing electricity that'll come under cables to Virginia Beach and, and power a lot of the homes and businesses in, in Virginia Beach. And, and where this goes, hopefully, is that we become an industry hub for what's gonna be offshore power, offshore wind turbines all up and down the Eastern seaboard. Uh, but Hampton Roads, because it's a deep port and it's so accessible uh, that we hope that we're the place that can construct a lot of these turbines and all the supplies that are needed to keep them twirling around. Number five, accelerate the understanding of digital connections. So Virginia Beach, the beneficiary of now four uh, two live and two almost live offshore cables. And these are the fastest fiber optic cables in the world. Our legacy infrastructure has cables coming in from different continents into Miami and into New Jersey, uh, New York, but they are really old and the lifespan is, is not in the cards for them. So these new cables are super fast and uh, are coming right into Virginia Beach and it's gonna transform for us this I-64 uh, innovation corridor. Already Virginia Beach is seeing the benefits of these cables with data centers coming there, but so too is RVA. There was a great cover story in Style Weekly recently that went into this whole story about data centers and new and the new underwater cables that it's really gonna transform our economy. You think about more than half of the world's internet goes through Northern Virginia. Um, and people locate all around Northern Virginia just to get that nanosecond of an advantage uh, in their business if they're trading commodities or, or even gaming or, or whatever. And, and so being located along this corridor is going to be a strategic advantage. And so White Oak Technology Park, which is right near the Richmond Airport, already seeing this uh, come to life. They're gonna have all, eventually 2.5 million square feet uh, and 200 employees there, all taking advantage of these cables uh, that are coming ashore at Virginia Beach. Uh, and, and who's behind them? Well, it's all the big West Coast tech companies. It's Google and Amazon. So this, this is gonna be massive for us and, and no one understands it. So part of what we're gonna do this year, um, we're gonna put on a, a series with a white paper an expert panel and get everybody up to speed on just what's happening and what it means for uh, localities and businesses along the I-64 Innovation Corridor. In Civic, one of the folks that's on the uh, MIC, or on the MIC, the Mega Region Institutional Council, they are the leadership metro of Hampton Roads. They're gonna, they have their, one of their projects this year is their classes working on getting ready for the spring when they're gonna 
present um, all this information to us. So I'll be sure to um, remind Martha to get out the uh, invitation for this particular briefing when it happens. Number six is increase the R&D collaboration, research and development. If you, if you think about the I-64 Innovation Corridor, we are blessed with major universities, uh, major colleges, uh, HBCUs, an incredible uh, community college system, uh, in, in federal research labs. I mean, it's just amazing with, with uh, NASA and Jefferson Lab and others. So how do we foster greater col uh, collaboration across the corridor? Uh, and so this is a, a whole nother area that we're thinking about and are gonna put plans in place to make sure that uh, researchers know what's going on, uh, you know, sort of across the hall, if you will, because this, this is where the magic happens when people start to understand uh, synergistically how to, how to uh, collaborate. Number seven is the Virginia Capitol Trail. We've got to find more ways to physically connect ourselves. And I tell you, this is another reason we have this great quality of life. This is a real tangible manifestation of it. If you look at this trail, it took 20 years to build, but it stretches from Richmond all along the James River uh, to Williamsburg. And um, it's got a lot of amenities along the path, but this is uh, paved and has you know nice bridges that go across swampy areas. It's just it's just an amazing thing that I would encourage everybody to spend time on. You can you can just do two or three miles at a time, or you can you can be bold and try to do the whole thing. But it, it is really incredible, uh, you know the 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 vision behind this and actually now seeing it complete uh, is just amazing. Well. There are plans in place to take it all the way to Fort Monroe, which everybody knows is right this side of the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel, uh, right near the Chamberlain Hotel. And so how, how do we do this? Well, right now the Hampton Roads PDC is planning these routes out and we're already starting to meet and RVA 757 connects as part of this. We're starting to meet with the uh, city managers of the jurisdictions that are all along this route, uh, the Williamsburg, um, Colonial Williamsburg Foundation and Cliff Fleet are very involved in this. And so we're in the process now of figuring out what are the public lands that can be used, but then how do we raise $70 million for some of the private lands? And how could we get, even get companies to do this, to come in and, and pick up a mile? But how do we string this together? And, and let's not say it's gonna take 20 years. Let's try to get this done in the next five years. But we're all about this because it's just one more thing that really demonstrates um, that we really care about well-being and, and quality of life and connections. Another connection is passenger rail service. Uh, and here we, we have some work to do. We, we have passenger rail service now between Richmond and, and Hampton Roads. We would just like more of it. Um, in order to get more, you have to have an environmental study done. And, and there are two levels, level tier one and tier two. Between Richmond and Washington, we have both tier studies done. So Richmond is in position when federal dollars become available for more and more rail service that we'll get our fair share. And also between Richmond and Raleigh, both tier one and tier two are done. We need tier two done uh, between Richmond and Virginia Beach. And that's about 25 million for these environmental studies. Um, and we just need to make it happen. So we've got to raise our hand and and point towards this as an important priority and to make sure everybody in the, um, in the government knows that this is something that we want as uh, this network of, of uh, players. And then number nine is the widening of 64. And so a lot of people call it different things. Um, gap funding is probably the, the most uh, used name. There's this 29 mile gap between basically Bottoms Bridge just past the Richmond Airport East and um, all the way to Williamsburg, it's just still two lanes. But the folks in Hampton Roads have pulled off an amazing feat. They have managed through their transportation authority to, to pull together $5.2 billion, which is huge for roadway improvements. And it's in fact gonna fund another, another tunnel for the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel, uh, which will end a you know, historic bottleneck that we've all been through in the summer times in particular. But, but their funding, also has widened 64 from the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel all the way to Williamsburg. And so if you ever go in that direction, you're, the, the work is, is proceeding and it's almost finished. I think 2024, the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel will be finished. 
So what does that mean for us? Well, this gap, we've got to find the funding for this. And uh, you know, we think it ranges in the 700 million category. So we've got to work with, you know, VDOT is now doing an I-64 improvements corridor study, which is great looking at the entire corridor. There's money in the I-81 improvements. That budget goes towards the 290 mile gap. And how do we uh, make this a priority in the future? And, and, and how do we go after the Biden infrastructure money uh, in making this a priority? Um, there's just no question we're going to grow as a state in, uh, in these two regions, and this is our main artery. So we've got to make an investment in, in all these ways that connect us together. This, this one in particular is important because it involves our military. Uh, the Port of Virginia is a huge uh, logistics um, center and distribution point that serves uh, a lot of the East Coast in terms of goods. 99% of all of our goods uh, actually, it gets into one of those containers at one point in their life. And so, so Hampton Roads Port's really important. They've got all kinds of growth plans, but they need to make sure 64 is, is uh, uncongested. And, and then the same with the state importance, tourism is, is one of our top industries in Virginia. So we've got to make sure that this main artery uh, is free flowing. Uh, and, and then God forbid a hurricane that, that would have the evacuation of Hampton Roads or or the Outer Banks, certainly you want 64 rolling. Um, and then lastly, the importance for Williamsburg's future in New Kent County and, and all of those areas right around uh, where it's just two lanes. So number 10 is not a priority, it's just what's gonna happen if we do all these things and we do them well, uh, and it's gonna put us on the map. We're not about marketing our region outside, we're about making all these connections happen inside. So we really have something to be proud of uh, that attracts people. Uh, there are plenty of organizations like our tourism bureaus and our economic development agencies that are, that are actually doing the marketing. We're just gonna give them some tools uh, and maybe a better story because of all the CEOs in both markets working together. And one of the tools we're gonna give them is literally a map. Because if you Google mega regions and you look at Google images and you hit images, and you see all these maps that people have put together about mega regions, we're not on the map. And we're gonna change that because we're gonna create our own map. And we're gonna put RVA and Hampton Roads on the map. And then we're gonna allow anybody to use that and give this map to our economic development friends and to our um, uh, you know, folks that are the city marketing teams and the tourism teams and just, and they'll point out at the right time that, yeah, we're on the map. We're the smallest, but the mightiest mega region, the one that, that thinks about innovation from a 400 year lens perspective and one that, that transcends technology. It's really about innovation uh, from, from the heart and soul. So that's who we are. We're trying to connect our two great regions and we're trying to do so uh, through this great artery, the I-64 and, uh, and brand ourselves as the I-64 Innovation Corridor. So be happy to answer any questions. Um, I'm gonna go off of, uh, off of the screen share. And uh, I first wanna just thank you for, for sticking with me for 40 minutes. Well, John, thank you so much. I think um, as always, this was illuminating to think about what's possible as we look to the future and especially along that corridor of innovation. Um, so I um, wanted to just open the floor for any questions from our attendees. Um, as a reminder, anyone who would like to ask a question or, or pose a comment to the group could do so in the chat. Uh, you can also raise your hand or submit something through the Q&A function, whatever you're most comfortable with. We'll be watching those and we can actually pull you right in so that you can ask the, direct, the question directly of John. Mrs. Page, I know you're out there. I don't know if you want me to read the question to the group or not, but I'd be happy to um, let you speak for New Kent County if you'd like. So we do have one question that came in that I'll read. Um, what are the prospects for, an, for a mega region extending north of Richmond, John? Well, that's a great question. And maybe the, the person that offered it had, um, has a sense of demography because demography is destiny. 
And uh, when I was studying demographics 30 years ago in, in college, in graduate school, there was the term, the Great Golden Crescent. And it referred to the population crescent that would become Baltimore, Washington, Fredericksburg, Richmond, Hampton Roads. And that that crescent would be where all the growth happens. It's the urban corridor. Uh, and that prediction has really come to fruition. I mean, if you go to Washington, you, you drive by Fredericksburg and, and just see how much that's grown and the backup on the, on the exits and, and so forth. Um, so where this goes as our, as our 64 mega region, uh, certainly one day we could, we could fold into the uh, Washington Baltimore mega region and they've included us in the name uh, and, and so maybe that happens. I, I would also say there's an opportunity to go further west and include Charlottesville, especially in the way we're talking about the innovation corridor. Um, we, we just became a 501c3 and, and got funding this past year. So um, we're doing a little bit of crawl, walk, run, but I think eventually those, those other two areas we should really consider um, uh, as, a, as our potential partners. Thank you for that. Um, another question came in kind of more generically, but when you were talking about the membership and the recruitment to get to that 75 for the board, yeah. how would someone who might be listening be able to express their interest in getting involved? Well, um, Sarah Jane Kirkland and Moses Foster are the two people that are heading up our board recruitment. And so um, if you have people's emails, we can send, we can send those two out. Great. That, yeah. Okay, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then another question, uh, John, is would I, I have your slides okay to send them out? And I think we've got a couple of people that would be interested in talking with you a little bit more. So I can yeah. facilitate some offline um, introductions and passing some information on. That would be great. And, we, and you know, we are, um, you know, we're a collection of people that just have a passion for um, you know, who we are as a, as a region and as a mega region. So, you know, we're, we're open to ideas and suggestions. We just, we, we want to have the biggest impact that we can have. That's all positive. It's about improving tomorrow. Great. Mrs. Page, I've pulled you in. You can speak now. Thank you so much, Martha. Thank you, Mr. Martin, for um, being with us this evening. Um, I um, first have to say thank you, Martha. I have, I think I've only missed one of these uh, webinars. You and, have perfect uh, attendance, I think. <laughs> I think I do, yes. And so especially today, I was listening, I was trying to multitask, I must, ex I must say that, <laughs> but um, nothing grabs my attention like I-64. I live in New Kent County. And so um, Martha and any other person that's on here that's in um, TPO, Plan RVA, or the Greater um, or the New um, Authority, uh, will tell you that my ears perk up, and I'm ready to go to wall with you to get um, to get us uh, connected. And right. so um, the your presentation, um, so many things in it. I have just said, not collectively, but a piece at a time has come to me. And so I am, I am excited about meeting you and talking to you and putting forth my efforts and um, surely rallying for others to, um, to become um, an innovative I-64 um, on this side of, of Virginia. That's right. And um, so I am, I mean, I can't tell you how it affects um, air, um, air, air um, bypass roads. Yeah. Um, the only good news about that is that we have so many people that have the opportunity to drive the country roads of New Kent County. And so to see history that they normally wouldn't see. Um, but the other part is that um, we have so many accidents because of it. Mm -hmm. And um, and so um, so much is missed out um, with, um, I think with. You can, I think with, you can have uh, both. You know, I think you can still preserve the history and uh, but also be be part of the making history. 
And I think that, you know, there are a number of, of industrial sites that are ready and you, you guys along that stretch, there's a preponderance of them, but the access isn't great. And so Absolutely. How, yeah. And so uh, working together on this would be, would be tremendous. I, um, your reputation precedes you. So I would love to meet you. Thank you. I think we, we still hold the record right now in the Commonwealth for having the busiest rest areas on our 64. <laughs> so uh, what a great place to um, display your, um, your um, different, your product information and um, your tourism information, but on I-64 here in New Kent County, exit 211. Yep. <laughs> so thank you again for being with us this evening. And thank you, Mom, um, for uh, being such a gracious host. Yes, thank you, Mrs. Page. And I think we will have to give you some kind of an attendance award. Appreciate you signing in every, every month. But John, the next question I have is, what are the benefits and drawbacks to a transportation planning process that would encompass all of the mega region? Well, that's a big question. You know, um, I'm gonna answer it by way of, of uh, the book that I referenced by Jonathan Barnett. Um, this book, the, the premise of this book, and uh, I think we've got some extra copies. If somebody really wants one, I, I can send out one or two of them. Uh, but, but the premise of this book is to say we have already in place an incredible infrastructure in planning process to make sure that our individual regions don't get messed up. That's a technical term, don't get messed up. And so Martha, your group is, is right at the tip of the spear on this. You know, There are processes that you go through to plan a region and the infrastructure that makes a region possible. And, and all across the country, those exist. But where they don't exist is on a mega region scale. <laughs> there is no process. I mean, you go and, and you know dearly Bob Crum and, and the Hampton Roads Planning District, but rarely do we say, okay, now let's think about planning on a mega region scale. And so this gentleman is, is a master planner um, and taught it at uh, University of Pennsylvania for his career. And that's what he says. It's like, boy, there's some places that are just gonna get messed up because they're becoming mega regions and there's no intentionality and are not thinking about it. So I think your, your question is spot on um, it's, it's not on our radar right now, just because we're just getting going. I don't know what, what will look like 20 years from now, this RBA 757 connects. Uh, but, but I think implied in your question is yes. How do we, how do we collaborate and partner on a bigger scale on things as important as, as transportation? Thank you. Um, we've got some feedback that there's folks that would love more information about that book. So in addition to the slide deck and some contact information, I will also push out a link about the, um, the book. Yeah. It's called Designing, Designing Mega Regions. Mm -hmm. Great. Anyone else have any questions? This is a quiet group this afternoon. Everyone must be cold and looking for the sun to come back. Well, John, I just wanted to say thank you so much for making time in your schedule to participate. I know that um, this particular topic is, is near and dear to your heart, uh, calling both the Richmond and the Hampton Roads regions home. So we appreciate um, your passion for this and uh, it would be great to be able to see some of the priorities that you talked about today come to life. So um, I think we are eager to continue to learn more and to be able to follow uh, and, and participate as, as possible. So thank, thank you so much. So much uh, we appreciate it for everyone that's watching. We really appreciate your time and uh, interest in the Better Together webinar series. As a reminder, we host these every third Thursday of the month at two o'clock. Um, if you'd like to get added to our invitation list, we will send out calendar invites and update you on the upcoming topics to be covered. And as always, if you have a recommendation or a nomination for a topic to be covered during the series, please just reach out. Thanks so much, everyone.